Well, welcome everybody. It's just another normal day in ODI. <laughs> Former Secretary Generals and Presidents right in front of me. Uh, it's good, just to say first of all, good evening and a, and a huge welcome to everybody here. This, this evening's event is co-hosted with the Elders and I'm delighted to welcome both the members of the Elders who are here as well as members of their uh, advisory council to, to be here in ODI. And it's a, I can say from the bottom of my heart, it's really a huge privilege to, to have all of you here. As many of you will know, the elders were initially brought together by Nelson Mandela, united by their sh shared commitment to advance the cause of universal human rights, peace and justice, and by their conviction that we can all make a difference. And as a group, you inspire us all to work for change. Uh, I just wanted to say by way of introductory re remarks that institutions can take hundreds of years <coughs> to develop. We have one just down the road here by Big Ben that is celebrating its 800th birthday this year. And it's got to where it is by root of a couple of civil wars uh, centuries of constitutional dialogue, stroke, gridlock, and the occasional beheading. <laughs> but between you, the, the elders, you've created an institution in your own lifetimes. And you've done so, I think, not just through what you've achieved individually, but through what you stand for collectively and the values that you represent. Values which, like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, reflect the best of humanity and provide us with a reminder of what we're capable of. Uh, we have with us eight of the elders, and if I were to um, read even a summary form of their CVs, we would be here for a very long time, and I would probably be carted off before I got <laughs> halfway through. So in order to avoid that, I just wanted to give you a very summary form of the uh, achievements of, of, of our guests. Uh, Marty Atisari, former president of Finland, not only oversaw Namibia's transition to independence, but played a key role in negotiating an end to hostilities in Kosovo and founded the Crisis Management Initiative. Like Dabrahami, sorry, Brahimi, who we'll be hearing from shortly, fought for his country's independence, became foreign minister, and subsequently built a distinguished career as a conflict mediator and UN diplomat. His report uh, in 2000 on US peace operations was path-breaking in its day, and I think retains uh, an extraordinary relevance and resonance for our own time. Grohal and Brundtland, who was Norway's first, prime, uh, first woman prime minister, was also the person who, I think more than anybody, put the concept of sustainable development on the international agenda uh, and, and provided a catalyst that really challenged policymakers and reframed the relationship between ecology and economy, and who through le her leadership of the World Health Organization has helped to establish health as, as a basic human right. President Jimmy Carter uh, has been a tireless and courageous champion of human rights throughout his life, working also for democracy and conflict resolution. He's extraordinarily well-traveled, actually. He's observed elections, 83 elections in 34 countries. Uh, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2002 for his efforts to promote peace building. He's the only US president to receive the Nobel Prize uh, out of off after leaving office. And apart from his work in promoting peace and democracy, the Carter Center has provided the sustained leadership that has brought uh, the guinea worm disease close to eradication, which is uh, an extraordinary achievement that has improved millions of lives uh, uh, across Africa. Uh, Hinad Jilani, who's a leading activist who founded the Pakistan, uh, Pakistan's first all-woman wo all law firm and the National Human Rights Commission. She was UN Special Representative on Human Rights uh, and awarded the Millennium Peace Prize for Women in 2001. Uh, Mary, Mary Robinson, the first woman president of Ireland, has been a source of inspiration for many people around the world, including me, I have to say. Uh, as UN Commissioner <laughs> for Human Rights, she demonstrated the power of human rights as a vehicle for achieving change. And both through her own foundation and as a UN Special Envoy for Climate Change, she has put climate justice at the center of the debate on climate change, reminding governments around the world that it is the poor 
and the marginalised who will be hit hardest and earliest by global warming. Uh, Ernesto Zedillo, a former president of Mexico, led transformative reforms at home and has championed the cause of inclusive globalisation. Um, over the past decade, we've all, I think, become increasingly aware of the role of conditional cash transfer programmes in lifting millions of people out of poverty. Uh, we sometimes forget, I think, that the prototype for those programmes was Progressa in Mexico, and it was introduced on his watch. Uh, he's also tirelessly campaigned for causes from nuclear non-proliferation to drugs policy reform and financing for development that address the great challenges of our age. The preamble of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights calls on everyone to work for the rights and freedoms at the core of human dignity, equality, peace and justice. I think collectively you more than anyone have answered that call and you're an inspiration to all of us. Uh, I also wanted to welcome uh, Lise Doucette, who is uh, a friend of ODI, but also someone who, in her own work, I think really reflects the values and the commitments that all of you stand for. Uh, Lise is the BBC's... Sorry, you're allowed to applause. <laughs> I'll have to remind them to put in stop, wait for applause. <laughs> Uh, Lees is the BBC's chief international correspondent and she'll, as I said, chair this evening's event. Uh, I'm really pleased to see so many friends here this evening. I would like to welcome those of you who are watching the event live around the world. Uh, please do follow the event on Twitter using the hashtag, um, hashtag capital M, capital E, crisis. Uh, this evening's event will begin with an introduction by Kofi Annan, who's the chair of the Elders. He really doesn't need any introduction, but uh, Mr. Annan was Secretary General of the UN from 1997 to 2006. He was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace jointly with the United Nations, quote, for their work for a better organized and more peaceful world. This is a world that Mr. Annan has worked tirelessly to create. He was the force behind the Millennium Development Goals and the Global Health Fund. His influence led to UN member states accepting a responsibility to protect citizens. He oversaw the strengthening of the UN peacekeeping, of UN peacekeeping and the establishment of two intergovernmental bodies, the Peace Building Commission and the Human Rights Council. And his Global Compact Initiative remains the world's largest effort to promote corporate social responsibility. Both in office and since leaving office, Mr. Nan has used his experience to mediate and resolve conflict. In 2012, he served as the UN Arab League Joint Special Envoy on the Syria crisis. Um, I could go on, he's chair of the Africa Progress Panel and many, many other things. He, he, he also has formidable persuasive powers, which I've been on the sharp end of <laughs> <laughs> a, couple, a couple of times. So, uh, Mr. Nan, it's a, it's a huge privilege for us to have you here, and uh, I'd, I'd like to pass it over to you now, if I may. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. And I think uh, you should be careful going around saying one doesn't need introduction. <laughs> you know, there, there's a story, Nan, and some of you have heard it enough, where we were taking holidays in Como, and we were traveling incognito. We, we really wanted to have peace and quiet. And we walked into it, and we thought we had succeeded until uh, we went into a shop to get a newspaper. And we saw a group of men st staring at us. And one of them broke away and walked straight to me and put his hand out and said, Morgan Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> May I have an autograph? <laughs> so I said, sure. <laughs> and I signed K. Freeman. He was happy. We were happy. <laughs> and we continued incognito. So, that would teach you to go around thinking everybody knows who you are. <laughs> no, it's really wonderful to be with you uh, here this evening. And we, the elders, are very grateful that you decided to organize this event uh, with us. Obviously, Middle East is a very topical issue. It's an issue that is consuming not just the region, but the whole world. Um, 
as a former Secretary General of the United Nations, I know both the human cost of wars and extremism across the Middle East. In the past, when one talked of Middle East, you were limiting yourself to Israel and Palestine. Today, when you talk of Middle East, it's a whole region. In fact, you may even begin in North Africa, going through the region all the way to Pakistan. There are problems everywhere. There are problems everywhere that we need to uh, try to stop. Conflicts can only be resolved effectively by addressing the root causes uh, of the problem. In the Middle East, and in many other cases, this comes down to the borders and definitions of nation states that were defined in an earlier period, in the colonial era. 100 years after the P sites pico Agreement of 1916, the borders and nation states it defined are almost near collapse. I saw this firsthand as former Secretary General, as former envoy for Syria, as uh, Kevin uh, mentioned. The disintegration of borders and established states' relations has wrought a terrible cost in terms of war, terror, internally displaced people, and refugees. Today we have with us one man, he's the only one I know who made peace in Middle East and made his stuff, President Carter. You are the only one who's done that. <laughs> Many have tried after you. <laughs> It's not, it's, not been, it's not been easy. Of course, LACTA did TF agreement. But <clears throat> what I, I want us to focus on is, the, is that if we are going to resolve the crisis in the Middle East, it's not only the US and the Russians who have to work together. They need to bring in the regional powers, Syria, I mean, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Turkey, possibly Qatar, which is funding quite a lot of these things. Because unless they make a common cause and discover that they have a common danger, we share a common danger, which if we don't come together to resolve, we will never be able to contain this uh, uh, crisis. Europe, after the 30-year war, realized that they had a common danger. They needed to come together, and they met in Westphalia, and we got the Westphalia Agreement. Will the countries in Middle East have their Westphalia moment and find a way out of this? Can they do it alone? What help should countries like Russia and the US bring to, to bear? They are working better now, and I hope it will continue and uh, they will be able to work and bring the regional countries together to make peace for the sake of the region, for the sake of the Syrians, who are today suffering interminably. And of course, quite a lot of the fighting going on in Syria has nothing to do with Syrians. They have lots of proxy wars and lots of people trying to uh, promote their own uh, agendas. And I, I hope this evening we are going to have a, a fantastic discussion, probably some ideas of how we can come out of this May image. It doesn't matter how small the idea is, but hopefully we will put some seats forward. So let me get out of the way so that Liz said can continue. <laughs> Liz, for you. Thank you very much, Kofi Annan, and, and thank you to, to all of you who have gathered here today with, uh, to be in the presence of all these extraordinary people who call themselves or who others call the elders. But let us describe them in the way that Nelson Mandela wanted them to be known when he first set up the elders, wise men and wise women of our time. And I think for the purpose of our discussion tonight and for all of you, the hundreds of you who are with us in wherever you are around the world, you're also the wise men and women of our time, because we are living uh, 
in the Middle East in what we call, journalists call it, a defining moment, but such a moment that is hard to define, hard to understand, harder still for us all to watch it unfold, and hardest of all, how to resolve it. Look across the region. It is, as the British say, we are where we are. Where are we? Fragile, failing, and failed states. And in what Kofi Annan nodded to, what the essential conflict, the first conflict of the Middle East that we worried about for decades, the two-state solution fast slipping away from us. But we also want to remind ourselves tonight that this is not just a question, a crisis among states. This is a crisis among the peoples of the region where social fabrics are being torn apart and where the dreams of an entire generation are being ripped away. None of us in this room can say we didn't know what was happening because the people of the region no longer waiting for our aid, our engagement, our help are coming to our door. And we're seeing that in this refugee crisis. So I think it's only fitting that before I go to our distinguished panelists, both Lakhtar and Hina, who have been introduced, as well as Just, who heads the Middle East and North Africa program at the crisis, International Crisis Group, and Sarah, who heads the ODI's um, humanitarian policy, um, looking at humanitarian policy, we're going to look first at a film that the elders have prepared, working with UNHCR, looking at the refugee crisis, because let us listen to the people of the region and what they tell us, what they ask of us as they are fleeing for their lives. في كثير من الناس بتخاطر بحياتها بين ايدين المهربين للجوء لاوروبا لو كنت مكاني هل لديك خيارات اخرى putting one's life in the hands of smugglers is very dangerous is very expensive it is of course extremely unfortunate unacceptable condemnable that there are people who, instead of helping the refugees, take advantage of them. The only real alternative is to demonstrate that there is a legal pathway for refugees to get to safety, and they don't have to put themselves in the hands of smugglers. I think that there are two options here. One is to multiply these alternative pathways, to give more options for resettlement, scholarships, humanitarian visas, family reunification. And the other important option is to provide more assistance to those countries that host large numbers of refugees and to the refugees themselves. <laughs> I'm confident that there will be peace. I can't tell you when, but it is important that the United States, the Russian Federation, and the regional powers work together at the cessation of hostilities hold and the peace process in Geneva succeeds. Peace will determine the ultimate solution to this massive displacement of refugees. People in Europe should know that we are fleeing in search of safety for ourselves and our families. What can be done to make them understand that better? We need to talk about this. We need to dispel the image that refugees are something we should be afraid of. Europe should understand that most of the refugees coming out from Syria and others are really seeking safety and protection. There shouldn't be that kind of amnesia which makes us forget what happened after World War II, where the whole world opened up its arms to receive European refugees. It is very, very important that we understand the importance of uh, receiving them, of uh, offering them opportunities in countries of asylum, and not erecting walls to keep them away from us. What has happened to compassion, empathy, solidarity? Morally, we have an obligation to help each other and respect the sanctity of life.
ليش في ناس عم يطلع لها اعاده توطين وناس لا؟ Every government decides how to welcome or not welcome visitors of any sort and the particular refugees. I think Europe with a population of 500 million should be able to absorb the numbers of refugees we are talking about. Uh, UNHCR has been promoting the notion that alternative pathways to uh, safety, to admission to third countries, to places where refugees can be taken care of in a better way, especially vulnerable ones. The solution is the return of uh, peace and stability to Syria and the possibility for Syrians to go back home. But it is not a problem for Europe alone. It's a global problem and other countries should be able to help. From America to Asia to Africa, we are in this together. We are in this together, ladies and gentlemen, I'm af and I'm afraid that is the reality. We can no longer say that Syria's war is about Syria. It, st it stopped long ago being just about Syria. It is everyone's war now. And as Kofi Annan says, we cannot just see this as a black canvas that nothing can be done. And I always like to say that when you're in the blackest of holes, the lights that shine, as small as they are, shine very brightly. And I think this is what we want to do with all of your experience and insight and wisdom that we've gathered here today. We'd like to try to move this discussion on a little bit. And I know Lakhtar doesn't want to be the one uh, to start off, but we've decided you will be the one to start off with. Um, and um, I always remember uh, when Lakhtar was the, the United Nations envoy, he was always apologizing to the Syrians in his very humble uh, Lakhtar way and apologizing on behalf of the world that I'm sorry that we simply could not do more to help you. And similarly with Kofi Annan, we're very privileged that we have two former envoys who did their best. But let us try to pick up on one of the things that Kofi Annan talked about and one of the things that you worked very hard for, Lakhtar Brahimi, in looking at how to resolve the Syrian crisis, because maybe there are insights there that can be applicable in some of the other problems in the Middle East. And Lakhtar, if I may say, Lakhtar used to talk about the three circles. The first, of course, the one that matters most of all, which is the Syrians themselves, bitterly divided, even more divided than when Kofi Annan was there and when Lakhtar Brahimi was there. The second level circle was that of the regional powers, and the divisions among them are even worse than during your time. The third one, and this is where you both spent a lot of your time and where Stefan de Mastura has as well, is the top level. Moscow and Washington. Sadly, new Cold War. But we are seeing some progress that the, right up to the level of Vladimir Putin and Barack Obama in trying to agree the ceasefire, which had a little bit of success, was holding, fell apart, and is going again. You looked at that so closely, Lakta, for years. Do you see in that high level, no other crisis in the world has that much attention at that high of a level, right up to the pres two presidents? Do you see that continuing to have an impact? Is that enough? It's not enough. Mm -hmm. um, I think both Kofi and I realized, you know, as you said, that uh, neither the Syrians themselves nor their neighbors were capable of uh, really doing something, uh, something uh, positive and successful to uh, put an end to that crisis. Um, Yes, I think we, 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 we saw and we worked very, very hard to bring the Russians and the Americans together. They did come together in spite of Ukraine and other problems. Uh, but I don't think, uh, my, my impression is that they, they do know what needs to be done. Uh, they maybe agree on uh, that that is the way to go. But they are held up by uh, considerations that have little to do with Syria. Uh, in particular, the, 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 the situation in the, in, in the region and the divisions that exist in the region, uh, each of these two governments uh, have uh, allies in the region and also outside of the region uh, who are pulling them uh, back. And I think the call is uh, you know, this is the worst crisis of this time. Um, you know, the, the country has been destroyed. 
like no other country that has uh, 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 known a uh, similar crisis, with the difference perhaps of Afghanistan at a certain time. Uh, so, you know, a, 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 a solution is, is absolutely urgent. The Europeans, I'm sorry to say, have started to realize this only when people started knocking at their door. Uh, there's nothing new uh, uh, today that was not there some years ago. Ask the, the, the Jordanians, ask the, uh, the, the, the Lebanese or, or, or the uh, Turks, and a lot of other countries who have received hundreds of thousands, millions of refugees. So I think the, the problem is known. The, the, the way to go is known. The people who can really pull this together and, and bring slowly everybody uh, to a table to uh, stop, you know, I mean, do a little bit more than what has been done about just a partial uh, ceasefire that's not even holding properly. I think you can do much better than that. Stop the conflict and, 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 and start, you know, walking away from, from, from the brink of where you are. It is, uh, it is doable. I think we must be grateful to Lavrov and, and Kerry for, uh, you, you know, their persistence and uh, trying to work together. But we expect more from them. This phrase, stop the conflict, I mean, I think everyone and most of all the Syrians, uh, at least the Syrians who are not on one warring side or the other, would like to stop the conflict. I mean, it's quite extraordinary what Moscow and Washington have been able to do. I thought of both of you when the gridlock was broken in the Security Council, and I think that was one of the main reasons why you left Kofi Annan, that it was not just the problems on the ground in Syria, it was the UN, which you spent so much time in, the gridlock. It was broken last December with that with a resolution about a, trans a plan for call it transition, at least evolving towards something different. So they did that. They did get a ceasefire that both of you worked so hard for. So there was progress, but how do you move then to what you've just asked for? Is it really within their grasp? Yeah, it is absolutely within their grasp. not listening to uh, yeah, on the ground. Yeah, the, no, the thing is, you know, my suspicion is that L Kerry, Lavrov, and the people around them know perfectly well what needs to be done. They, they know that perfectly well. Uh, and they would like to do it. The thing is that they are prisoners of, uh, you know, alliances that they have built, uh, you know, all the alliances that existed, and the alliances that they have built at the beginning of the conflict when they had the wrong analysis of what was happening. Mm -hmm. You know, when, you know, the idea was, you know, everybody was talking about the day after, mm -hmm. meaning that, you know, the, uh, the regime is fallen, is going to fall tomorrow, perhaps at the latest the day after tomorrow, so let's see what, what, what we need to do. And it has taken them five years to realize that this is not going to happen. They have, re they have realized that now. We, we, I think they have now to overcome that, uh, you know, the consequences of those wrong analysis and wrong understanding and wrong policies built on that understanding uh, you know, they've got to, to walk away from that and, and build a new policy. They know exactly what it is on, on the realities that exist and on the needs of the Syrian people, please, not on the needs of anybody else. Uh, and if the, the, the interests of the Syrian people is served, everybody else's interests will be served, whether it is the, the Europeans who are terribly afraid of uh, this uh, uh, migrants and, and, and refugees, or the neighbors who have all sorts of problems, real and imaginary, and their problems will be solved if the Syrian uh, are, are satisfied with the, uh, how, how, how this problem is starting to be solved. I mean, that's really good to hear that you think they, they do know, they do know what has to be done and possibly could, could, could do it, so, you know, obviously with, with, the, with the other actors. As we all know in Britain, what was said about the experience in Northern Ireland is that it only worked because all of the sides recognized there was no longer a military solution. They recognized that there, it wasn't, it, they could not win militarily. I don't know whether they're there yet in Syria. You still have President Assad talking about an all right out victory. You still have uh, such a dizzying array of groups. But I want to move to you, Hina, now, and to pick up on Lakhtar's stop the conflict. 
we are living in a time where never have we had so many ways to tell people there are consequences if you continue to fight a war as if there were no rules in war. And never, I think, have we seen a conflict where international humanitarian law is being violated day in, day out. You know, talk about war crimes prosecutions, you know, invoking of the norms of responsibility to protect, lots of statements, but no action. When you see all that as a, you know, a prominent lawyer, you've dealt with some of those issues in, in Pakistan as well. Do you see any power within that to try to bring this process along? Yes, I do see the power. That's why these institutions were created and these values were built and developed over so many years. Uh, see how much uh, uh, you know, uh, time has been taken to develop these norms. Now, you talk about universal values of human rights. If there is a, an international community, that international community got constructed around these values. And this is the core of the belief that, that uh, in any way justifies the term international community. But what we forget is that universal human rights are as important as the realization that if there is a universality of human rights, then there is a universal universality in the duty to protect. And if you forget that responsibility, then the uh, international community is either lacking the will to uh, uh, realize that that responsibility is a collective responsibility to save people's lives, to give dignity to people who are going through a crisis, and to find solutions that dignify people and do not uh, deprive them of not just the means of subsistence, but also the very important core human right, which is the right to dignity. And I think what we see right now is not just an influx of people who have lost homes, who are in terrible conditions, uh, there are, they have rights which are not respected, but at the same time, the way that they are referred to, I think that's very disparaging. Hmm. And I think that when you, you say, you, you just talk about the refugee crisis, these refugees are actual persons. Mm. Every one of them is a, an individual who has these rights. Secondly, you, you talk about creation of institutions. I think it's an important point that you make because these institutions, their very existence gives us the hope that things will be done. Yet, when there are so many of these institutions, uh, everybody thinks it's somebody else's responsibility to take care of this problem. The most authoritative mandate on peace and security and accountability for gross human rights violations that are the cause and effect of human rights violations, uh, the, the cause and effect of conflict, then it is the, first, the first thing that we look for is action on the part of the Security Council. Well, this is it. I mean, what is, I mean, in terms of the toolbox the world has now, is there anything which is not being used that could be used? Because we have seen in the Balkans War, we, you know, in the, the court for the former Yugoslavia, we have seen in Liberia that criminals do go to court, that there is an end to impunity, but it's long after the wars have ended. And unfortunately, you know, if Syrian war, as so many have said, if Syria's war goes on much longer, there's not going to be a Syria anymore. So what in the world's toolbox could still be used? What could happen at the UN Security no, Council? In the world's toolbox, these tools are eventually used. The point is, if you use, don't use them at the right time in order to deflate conflict mm. and in order to deter the uh, political shenanigans that go behind the causing of conflict, mm -hmm. and people have some sense that there is somewhere accountability, which is very serious, and it will happen, then I think the institutions lose the credibility that we need to give to them yes. so that we can, we can uh, eventually depend on these tools to work. Okay. okay, so we have Dr. Brahimi telling us they know what to do and could do it. We have Hina Jalani saying we have the institutions and they could work. But let's for a moment say, sorry, you're wrong. <laughs> what do we do? We turn to the International Crisis Group, who will tell us <laughs> what to do. So let's say for the moment that they're not going to work eventually. What other things can happen sometimes by default or the way things will just evolve? For example, the borders. You know, there's talk in Syria that it will be 
soft partition. There's talk about that in Iraq and in Libya as well. Does the region have any resources or ways of dealing with this crisis that doesn't mean an all-out war, you know, an all-out forever war? It would be nice to think so. Mm. <clears throat> and it is also very easy to be disheartened by what is going on. Um, I think that, um, you know, we've seen a, a huge humanitarian crisis that is ongoing. We've also seen remarkable resilience still on the part of people in Syria remaining. There are pockets of quiet. Uh, people have been displaced but are making do. They haven't become refugees yet. We have refugees who are doing remarkably well under this very adverse circumstances. Um, I think, by and large, people want to solve this. And certainly the information that comes out of Syria is that people are searching for, for solutions still and are looking for the international community, such as it is, uh, to come and weigh in. Um, I think the, uh, in Syria there was a, uh, um, a, sort, of a, a um, sort of a sort of a gratitude for the Russians to come in, in a way, because someone was acting decisively. Mm. We, can, we can agree or disagree with what the Russians are doing, but at least there was that. And now the uh, agreement between the United States and Russia is building on that. I think what, if we look at what a solution might look like beyond a political process started by these two powers and then really by Syrians themselves, is some way to accommodate the countervailing interests and, and claims that people are making and that they've been allowed to make once a dictatorship is, is, has crumbled, basically. Um, and crumble. we'll, crum well, I mean, the, 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 the dictator is there, but the, in Syria? In Syria, but, the, but the institutions are crumbling, they're very weak, mm. and it is, it is anyone's guess uh, that if and when Bashar al-Assad goes, and sooner or later he will go, what is left and what can be preserved? And this is a key question. How do you govern a country? Mm. And, and I think what, what we're seeing through the, the, the situation on the ground in many different places in Syria, but you can also look at Iraq or in Lebanon, which have very weak governance structures, is that people are actually doing qu quite remarkably well by themselves, using their own wherewithal and their own, and their own uh, means. And I think, in the end, we'll need to come to some kind of decentralized system, and I don't mean a mm. partition kind of system, ethnically defined or, or defined by religion, but, uh, but based on local communities where people can start um, building up again and build a new political system. And whatever that will look like, I have no idea. It's too far away. But it has to start from the ground up. Mm. And I think the basis is already there. It's certainly not. The, the overall structure is no longer there. So it cannot start from there. Mm. And just because I think we sh just want to mention an another element, which hasn't been mentioned, but it, sh we sh it should be here as part of our discussion. The threat that everyone says we should all be working together, but in fact doesn't seem to be br bringing people together to fight a common threat, which is Daesh or so-called Islamic State or ISIS the way mm -hmm. it is. I mean, the, you know, Stefan de Mastura, when he took over the job, said at least when it comes to Syria, but it could also be now applied to Libya and Iraq, is that this is one thing which is going to bring the sides together because they have a common enemy. Even that wasn't enough. Uh, and there's always the allegations of who's working with who. How do you see that working uh, through the crisis as we've already discussed it? Well, you know, um, the United States clearly is focused on, on, mm -hmm. the, on, on Daesh, on the Islamic State, uh, and on Jabhat al-Nusra, the uh, Syrian branch of al-Qaeda. I think the, uh, for everyone else, uh, Daesh is the second enemy, and they have got a, a more important one that they're fighting directly. And this is what is creating uh, the problems and the proxy wars that are taking place. But I, I, if you look at, uh, and I think we have to come back to this, uh, I hate to put it in sort of cold... Uh, power terms, but that is what we come back to. The, I mean, the values and the moral voice that the elders bring is critically important. But in the end, it is about also about Russia and the United States coming to an agreement. They both have the Islamic State as an opponent, and for Russia it's very important. Russia has other priorities as well. But what the other thing they have in common is that they both want to preserve some kind of state system in Syria mm. that can provide some kind of stability beyond the changes that, that will have to take place. And, and I think uh, that is also something very important to, to build on when the United States and Russia uh, move forward on this. And that is something that, the, because n n no one in the region except the Islamic State and the Kurds want to get rid of the borders and of the, this, the state orders that mm. were created exactly 100 years ago next week. And, um, uh, and so there, there can be common ground on that as well. There is an enemy that that everybody has, maybe not a priority one, but everybody has, that's the Islamic State and these radical groups. 
And the second is that you, you want to maintain still this order somehow. Maybe it's too late, maybe not, but there is the, the wish, the desire is there. And so in order to do that, you need to rebuild something that mm -hmm. can hold together this more decentralized system. Mm -hmm. and so I, I think that offers some hope. But there, the, you're actually absolutely right. I mean, this is probably the one thing that, I don't know if you agree, Dr. The one thing that they all agree on in Syria, except perhaps for Islamic State, is that the state has to be kept. No one wants Islamic State to march on Damascus. The Saudis agree with that, the Iranians, the at Americans, long last. At, long, at long last. Yeah, they want yeah, to, they want yeah. to, was, they want to. It wasn't the case a long time ago, you know. Uh, you, you, you want something. Look, Syria is not going to be divided. Mm -hmm. There is no, no base on which to divide Syria. They, the, the Syrians were very proud to say that they are a mosaic and they want to remain that mosaic. And they can remain that mosaic. How do you move out of this? If you stop the flow of money, if you stop the flow of weapons, you already uh, you know, will, will, will do a giant step towards ending the war. Once the war is ended, the Syrians, you know, they are quarrelsome people all the time. They have always been uh, quarrelsome. They will continue to quarrel, but within, within a peaceful state. And uh, rebuilding what has been destroyed will take a very, very long time. Uh, but you, if, you know, again, we go back, if, if the Russians and the Americans can bring their, all their allies uh, to go along with them, then I think we'll have, we'll have a, a very good beginning for something that's not going to happen uh, you know, overnight, but it will be much quicker than people think. So if you want something hmm. optimistic, hmm. there you are. You don't because cause if we are looking for those small pinpricks of, of light, I mean, we are at a time in the region where at least they're talking in Syria, mm -hmm. at least they're talking in Yemen, at least there is a political process, a difficult, fragile one in Libya. I want to ask all of you, just with a show of hands, do all of you think, as you look at the world now, we are where we are, do you f feel that given at least as the pretense of talks, that we're back, we're in an area, we're in a moment where it's about managing the conflicts and it can sort of, it'll be managed and kept at its current level? Or do you fear actually, that actually it's going to continue to get even worse? How many of you feel that we're reaching a moment where perhaps we've seen the worst. We've seen the worst, and perhaps there'd be a way of trying to deal with the crisis. How many of you feel feel that that we're getting to managing the crises rather than seeing it even worse? Oh, and how many of you are kept up at night because you think, "My God, it's going to get even worse"? <laughs> oh dear. So, oh, wrong. Most of ODI, in fact. Um, <laughs> which is <laughs> okay. Now, tough questions. We've talked about the Americans, and we talked about the Russians, and Lecter had a, a sort of talked about the Europeans and about the, re the problems in the region. Europe. Europe is supposed to be the home of democracy and values. They're now dealing with a huge crisis that they have never seen since the Second World War, and they are not doing very well. Mark. Uh, sorry, not Mark. Sarah. Uh, Mark, sorry. Sarah, what, when you look, when you at ODI, think of humanitarian policy, this emergency on Europe's doorstep, and when they come to resettling the refugees, whether or not to take the refugees, do walls come up or do walls come down? I mean, how do you see this crisis un unfolding? Do you see that as getting worse, or do you think Europe is going to find a way to deal with it? It's interesting that you call it the refugee crisis. You know, I often say to my colleagues, Europe doesn't have a refugee crisis. What we have is a crisis of European solidarity. It's not a crisis of numbers. I mean, the numbers are insignificant compared to what we see in the region. So Mr. Brahimi was saying um, how, how many refugees are in the region, the vast majority. 86% of refugees globally are in the countries that neighbor their country of origin. 50% um, of the displaced and the refugees are hosted in the Middle East. Um, and that's globally. You know, those who arrive to Europe, they're really a small amount. And surely Europe could do better in terms of upholding you know, those principles and those values that has been calling other states to uphold for a very long time. You know, Europe has always made very strong pronouncements about the asylum regime and made demarches to you know, countries that were hosting large numbers of refugees for a very long time. And now, you know, with the uh, policies or deals like, you know, the deal with Turkey, we are, you know, really um, 
showing the worst side of you know hypocrisy really you know there are many countries the host refugees in large numbers they're teaching us a lesson in terms of morality in terms of humanity and unfortunately we're setting a precedent i mean look you know just two days ago the announcement of the government of kenya you know thinking of closing the camps of kakum and adab the host hundreds of thousands of people how are we gonna ask you know as european countries kenya not to do that when we are not welcoming refugees anymore and yet we have a lot of examples from around the world of how much benefit refugees do bring to our economies and our societies. Every study that has been done from resettlement studies in Canada, in the US, in Australia, but also in Uganda shows the value that they bring in terms of economic benefit, but also the values in terms of you know, when they're socially integrated that they bring in terms of diversity in the society. Now, the key element is investing in them. It doesn't happen you know, by default. You know, there have to be policies that really support the refugees, you know, to make this contribution to society, like Germany is doing, like Sweden has been doing, like many countries have been doing, you know, globally for many years. Um, it, refugees will not be deterred by the kind of policy that we're putting in place. But some, some, I mean, it is Europe's crisis, and you do say it's a crisis of solidarity, but it's underlined that European values differ by European country, and some Europeans have different values than other Europeans. If, Hung just to say, if Hungary and Poland insist that they are simply not going to take any more refugees, it's not a question just of the leaders, but that people in their countries don't want any more refugees and don't accept the statistics you mentioned, is it then incumbent on Germany to take even more, Sweden to take every, even more? I mean, even Britain is not taking that many. Canada has the luxury of being an ocean apart and can take in more and can be a bit more choosy, but they are opening the door to refugees. So how do you see this developing then, since yeah, I mean, there isn't a European... Mr. Anand said it is a global yeah. crisis, and clearly there has to be a global solution. But even within Europe, I think, you know, the, 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 if you want, the media are dominated by the lines of populist parties that unfortunately tend to have, you know, the, the last word at the moment on this debate. But actually, I am not so sure that, you know, in so many countries, even in Hungary and Poland, uh, people don't want refugees because you also have a lot of volunteers, a lot of people that are actually helping refugees, including in those countries. We have, you know, 50,000 little organizations and groups of volunteers have sprung up all over Europe. <laughs> They're actually doing the work that a lot of the institutionalized, you know, international NGOs are not doing quite at the scale that is required in Europe. But people are moving you know, by the stories, they are moved by a sense of solidarity. It's just that, you know, they're not being supported by the political leadership that is required to make choices are more courageous. But I so think there are... You, what would you say to Federica Mogherini, who, who, or any of the other European leaders, they came up with this plan to resettle 160,000, was it? And they have settled a fraction of it. And they had a big London conference uh, for Syria for 20 billion, and now... 1.5 billion has been raised of that, so 19 billion to go. So the, the, the words are great, but the reality is not. Yes, we should be ashamed. Yeah. That yeah. would say to her that we should be ashamed of our actions mm -hmm. because we cannot turn our back on a crisis that is so deep and so profound um, when you know, many other countries are clearly supporting refugees so much more significantly than we are doing. We need to do our share. Other countries outside Europe need to do their share, but you know, this is incumbent upon all of us, and we cannot shy away from it. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, I think the one area, they have been, there's been a little bit more effort into trying to, you know, to patrol the coast, but that, of course, is a, is a security response, but they haven't done what the UN said. You have to have screening. You have to deal with this as a proper refugee crisis. If some of them are migrants and decide at the borders or decide somewhere in the region who's a refugee and who's not, if you have place for migrants who are seeking jobs and those decisions should be made. Um, in my profession, we say, thank God, we only have to write about it because it is, <laughs> it, is, it is difficult to. I want to just begin by opening it up to all of you. We want to try to pick up on, on some of the threads. And if you want to raise your hand and say who you are, either we can pick up with the political side of things, with what the, how Lakhtar has set it out, or with the refugee side. Um, so 